Well, I'm Carrie Bard, and I volunteered to start because I have a little story that applies to what I think about video art today, which is that I triple booked my day, and I spent from 8 until 10 doing grad admission interviews on Skype, and the third one had a technical difficulty, but I couldn't cancel the fourth one. <laughs> so we went overtime on the third one and moved into the fourth one. And by that time, I was a little late leaving the house. But the reason I feel that that's appropriate for today's conversation is that we are so driven by technology and the fact that we always have our devices, our iPhones, our everything, wherever we go, um, our time is controlled by our devices and maybe not so much by our body, um, by our bodies. Although, since everybody had to take a break before we began, I started <laughs> thinking, well, maybe the bodies play a role in that too. <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> I, I like that idea of of how technology has become more of a mediating force than our bodies. And video work has sort of changed from a documentation of body work to a documentation of expressions of the person online, which I think a lot of your work speaks to. Um, yeah, and I think maybe Carla could talk well, a little Well, maybe bit. you didn't say your name, and I guess oh, I'm maybe sorry. we should do that. <laughs> I'm Joel Kinnan. Uh, I am senior editor and COO at Art Slant. I'm an arts writer and curator. Um. Um, I'm Carla Gannis. I'm an artist. I have been working in video art since the late 90s. I came out of painting. I had studied at a school in Boston and I was making oil paintings, still putting pigments on canvas. And I moved to New York City. I was uh, uh, in my mid-20s. And I started assisting artists who were working with new technologies. Video, conceptual work that ba was based on databasing things, working in Photoshop and Quark. And it was just, it presented a new world to me that was really exciting. So I threw away all my paintings from grad school. <laughs> Baldessari was an influence there. And uh, began working with photography and video. And then that went into working with digital technologies, working on the internet. And today I kind of describe my work as a transmedia-based practice where I come up with a core concept. Generally, I do it through drawing. And then I express it across media channels, which includes quite often video. And it's really fascinating, particularly working with technology, because you have to be so elastic um, in terms of you know, body references, but just in terms of working with this, this, these different media um, that are always changing, and you have to adapt to it. So, for example, I remember working in 640 video that used to fill up my computer screen, and today it's a postage stamp, and now I'm working in 4K video, you know? So uh, that's something that I think is really kind of specific to a new media-based practice, is that kind of need and necessity to be elastic and, and changing and adapting to your process. Hi, my name is Chung Hee Moon, is my last name. <laughs> I'm a, a multimedia artist, like based on socially defined, a uh, social definition. Um, so I, I guess I started with watercolor and drawing since I was 12. And then I decided to move to America around my late teen and got my printmaking degree in lithography, mostly from Texas. And I moved here, start practicing interdisciplinary um, program at School of Visual Art, their fine art program. I always was into art, whether or not it was um, um, software-based or traditional medium like drawing or painting, but I always separated it. Uh, I was tried to be a manga, character designer while I was teen, like playing uh, video game, like 24 hours, stay up late five days straight, learning Photoshop. But I never thought of Photoshop could be uh, integrated as a, a fine art realm. And then when I moved to New York, uh, I saw like what artists doing it, like a net art or like design as an art, things like that where, you know, I think I can use 
the software as my tool to create and put in the context of fine art. You know, that was my awakening moment where I start using uh, Arduino, processing like interactive uh, electronic uh, medium into my work. I would say that you're immersed in technology, that you're really interested in technology and every new thing that comes along, because I think you told me that you wanted to um, get into immersive um, 3D software now. Um, so it seems to me that you're very interested in all the latest developments in technology and this is what sort of drives your pursuit. Yes, I mean, uh, my art practice is highly influenced by what I want to learn mm -hmm. in my next stage, and I love learning. And now, where I, wor where I work, you know, we start developing a VR environment. So we're setting up the Unity and Oculus, all that thing now. So I'm actively learning 3D modeling, uh, 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 environment designing and uh, through the Unity software. Uh, yes, but uh, edit it down. Um, my practice is actually uh, starting from my conscious motivation to learn language, like English, because I start associating certain word with my emotion. There's literacy and technology, and then that makes its way into expression, into art practice. Yes. When, when these tools become something that's sort of universal and essential in speaking a language that exists today. Yes. So my work, if you see it, there's a very strong uh, emotion involved, sensation involved, uh, by sound or how the frame got edited. Like frame by frame, literally. Eh, mi nombre es Jorge Susuli, yo soy crítico de arte, curador y profesor en la Universidad Nacional de 3 de Febrero en cuestiones vinculadas con estéticas de New Media. Me interesa mucho lo que se está diciendo vinculado porque vincula la cuestión del cuerpo con el dispositivo. Si, si en Foucault, en Michel Foucault, el dispositivo es un eh, elemento que somete al cuerpo, me parece que el arte eh, tiene la capacidad como de subvertir esta, esta habituación y este sometimiento que el cuerpo necesita para producir de manera sistémica. Y creo que el video, eh, centralmente desde sus inicios, con la noción de video expandido, le propone al cuerpo del espectador ser parte de la obra y ser obra. Y en este sentido creo que todos los, los desarrollos vinculados con lo digital, con la realidad aumentada, digamos, potencian esta, esta zona de no disciplinamiento del cuerpo, más que de sometimiento, ¿no? Que el cuerpo eh, se sustraiga a esta noción de dispositivo vinculada al poder. I find what you say very interesting because one of my interests is in creating a relationship between physical and virtual space. That um, many things that happen online are also happening in real space, real time. And how can we make those things intersect in works of art? And what you describe is exactly this idea of the immersive environment where the viewer is implicated or asked to do something very specific. Um, and I do think that's a very interesting direction for contemporary art or video. But Likewise, um, for the past few years, I've been working on a project that's titled The Selfie Drawings. And I, as a over 40-year-old woman, was really interested in engaging, and a lot of my work is about that, uh, you know, digital semiotics and the kind of methods that we use just in uh, contemporary culture to uh, communicate with each other or to communicate and express our identity. And so I started kind of interrogating what the selfie is and in relationship to self-portraiture. And the work began as a series of digital drawings 
that I then transcribed. I like to kind of describe the process as a, a transcription into a new medium. And so I transcribed it into 4K video, and now I've published a book where you have the static book that gets revivified each week by God in reality, which is um, animated, and they're in 3D or 2D, but in a new dimension where those two kind of environments are overlapping. And all of the work is really um, an investigation of the body you know, in these different spaces and their relationships and the intersection points. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's a work that you did of, um, it, it goes between you in like kind of a Victorian dress mm -hmm. and then like it, it sort of like dissolves away and then mm -hmm. it comes back. And that, that whole, that breathing, I, I found really captivating because it, it is a sort of like question of like presenting the image, the body as image and what considerations are taken into that. Um, yeah, I, I just like that about your, your well, work. Well, that particular piece was inspired, one, by the first selfie that was taken, that I found online, <laughs> in um, the beginning of the 20th century, and it was really interesting. It, it kind of alluded to the yellow wallpa wallpaper in a way, because she's in this oppressive environment. There's wallpaper, and you know, her dress is you know, patterned, and, and she kind of exists within this patterned world. And so that was the first selfie. And then I'm really influenced by speculative fiction, too. And someone like Marge Piercy, for example, who's written a lot about kind of the body in relationship to technological spaces. And, and we see these kind of fracturing. And in some way, I was trying to express that in that film, too. But also a passage of time and a relationship to technology across you know, these, these different eras. Mm. And it's interesting to think of even in relation to early video art, like Vito Acconci pointing mm -hmm. his finger at his cent center of the screen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I, um, I bumped into Vito when I was on my way to teach at Pratt. Mm -hmm. And I said to him, gee, this is really serendipitous because I'm about to show your video to my class. I'm going to show centers. He said, don't show that. And <laughs> I, said, he, I said, why not? And he said, because I made a mistake. I said, what do you mean you made a mistake? He says, nobody gets it. I said, well, I just downloaded it off of Ubu Web, and anybody who reads the description can understand what you were doing then. <laughs> and he said, it doesn't matter. I made a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. And I said to him, well, you made the first selfie. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> el, el error también forma parte del, del hacer artístico, ¿no? Yeah. Hace un año curé una muestra que se llama La Certeza del Error. Bruce Nauman, <laughs> Bruce Nauman failing to, you know, levitate yeah. in the studio. You know, yeah. so many artists have worked with that concept of failure. Yeah. Yeah. Y, y bueno, en, en esta, la muestra se sustentaba en que justamente eran, mu, había muchos videos, entre ellos Bill Viola, eh, Pipilotti Rist, eh, Takeshi Murata, eh, Joan Jonas, digamos, como el, el error era algo central para la producción estética y sobre todo del, del video. ¿no? Pipilotti Rist, I think, and. Uh, Pipilotti Rist. Uh, Bill Viola, Bill Viola yeah. Takeshi Murata, yeah. Yeah. Glitch, Glitch Art. John Satram from Chicago, mm -hmm. do you know him? He's a... And John yeah. Cates. Yeah. John Cates. Yeah. 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 John Satram, he's, I think he may have started Rosemary. this whole Glitch idea in Chicago, and there was a big Glitch school out of Chicago yeah. Yeah. working with... Dirty New Media is what they call themselves. Yeah. And Dirty John Dirty Cates was the one that coined that term, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. and, but John Satram... Is definitely like part of that movement, and I mean, there's like a very healthy new media scene in Chicago um, yeah. sure, that works mostly with the mistake. That's yeah. kind of uh -huh. mm -hmm. yeah. Interesante. Mm -hmm. Voy a voy a investigar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, it reminds me too of uh, Nick Breeze's practice. I find really interesting because he uses um, he uses the video tutorial from like the YouTube video tutorial yeah. format as the vehicle for his his practice and to teach. How to teach young kids how to make glitch art, to how to like use these tools and break these tools and get a sense of them. Actually, video tutorials are my inspiration. I watch so many. <laughs> I, I even use uh, the get a section of it and put it uh, in my sound. Yeah, a lot of yeah, them. So yeah. Mostly men, though. Yeah, that process yeah. orientation. Yeah, but they, 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 their main goal is teach you how to see things, the spectrum of the human perception that is dependent on technology or the software they're using. Because 
and the Photoshop see image a certain way, 3D software sees an image in a certain way, and human need to adopt it, and human eyes need to adopt it. And just things happening now that um, artist friend that I know is making a rendering of this gallery all in right now. And he put like skin and did some lighting and make really realistic. And yesterday I saw Instagram photos of this landscape taken with some wide lens camera, kind of fisheye. It was like photograph, but it looks like 3D rendering. So there's a problem with this, is this real or not? Well, that's really interesting because also coming out of SAIC is Claudia Hart and the whole mm -hmm. real fake. And, you know, she's written a lot about this in curated shows, you know, where artists are constructing these virtual environments that are post-photographic, but they still read as photographic, mm -hmm. you know, and that real fake tension, I think, yeah. is really kind of a, a major dynamic in, in contemporary well, and art. And it even parallels what's going on in film, because there are all these, um, like Adam Curtis, for example, who worked for the um, archives in Britain, has created his own nar uh, narratives out of archival footage. So yeah. basically he writes historic narratives, but from his perspective, which aren't the normal narrative that you would hear. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's film essay. Yeah. 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 And, but I think that, that too um, is an interesting direction in that narrative has shifted. There are so many different ways to tell a story now. And I think Hito Shero does very interesting oh, very work just in terms yeah. of all the different ap um, approaches to using media, but also the way she weaves the tale is mm -hmm. quite... Pero hay algo me, me parece nuevo con el advenimiento de lo digital, ¿no? y que lo han señalado muchos teóricos. Que es, la idea de que, que es la idea de que eh, por primera vez los dispositivos técnicos de registro con lo digital no, no requieren de un referente. Es decir, que yo, se puede construir una... A, hay un teórico que le llama a esto máquinas de concepción. No necesito del mundo. Es decir, un algoritmo puede configurar la imagen. Solo necesitamos matemáticos, en Muy realidad. Bien. Sí. Yeah para configurar el mundo. Eh, Borges, Jorge Luis Borges, That's tiene the, un yeah, cuento yeah. donde eh, hay un mapa a escala real yeah. que se superpone mm -hmm. sobre la ciudad real. Yes, and the map then, because they make the map such a perfect simulation, it then becomes the city virtually. I mean, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, simulacra and simulation. Yeah. Yes. I think, I think an interesting moment right now is that we're coming towards the end of simulacrum and getting closer to a moment where there is no more referent absolutely right. mm -hmm. and and the singularity however you want to call it like <laughs> yeah. let's bring that up but like <laughs> that's, that's exactly what the horror is yeah. saying I, yeah pero a pesar de perdón pero a pesar de ello hay artistas que digamos subvierten esta lógica hay eh, ahora aquí este eh, he visto un film de Tony Ausler y la muestra eh, imponderabilia, imponderabilia que trabaja sobre esa tensión entre lo fantasmático y lo real. Y, y el film es como una suerte de superposición de capas, eh, casi este, en donde no se deja entrever qué es lo real y qué es lo fantasmagórico. Off of, off of this idea, I'm, I'm kind of curious for the, for the video artists, how, given that there are opportunities to like show film within digital worlds, like within like a completely constructed space, and then there's still the opportunity to show in a gallery and like more traditional settings, what do you prefer? Like what, what do you think works best now for the work that you're producing? Personally, I really like public space which isn't a gallery space, yeah. but if I could put all my video on a truck and drive it around the city, I'd like that <laughs> the best. And, I think you can um, do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I have done that, actually. I did, yeah. I did that in the UK, and I've also done a billboard on a truck. But right, yeah. I, I really like the idea of public space. Um, I think the internet is great. I spent years working on a piece that was a 
um, collaboration with people from around the world to remake Vertov's Man with a Movie Camera, yeah. which actually led me to start thinking a lot about time because that film of his was made in 1928, and there wasn't one shot longer than 22 seconds. And at the time when I started it, I thought, this is really MTV time. But now it's really new tech, mobile technology time. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. that we don't have any time. Everything moves so quickly. The new technologies, like Jung is learning one day after the next, are moving so quickly that um, we have a different kind of perspective of time and perspective on time and space. Absolutely. Do you think work should be shorter in a way? Like, do you think the, the work that is short and compressed to that <laughs> moment can be more effective than like well, an eight minute piece? I like Lorna Mills' work, for example, and they're all gifts. You know? <laughs> and, and somehow she's managed to take the web colors and make it look really seductive. And that works. It's kind mm -hmm. of a language of the web, yeah. specifically. And it was but, just in Dreamlands at right. Whitney, and yeah. you know, because I was one of the participating artists in that. And I mean, there was one thing also about that context. It's in a museum, but just the generosity of the spirit of Lorna. You know, she mm -hmm. invites hundreds of artists. Each artist is listed, you know, and and, and represented, you know, in this space. Yeah. And we each had our one minute, you know, mm -hmm. to recontextualize <laughs> uh, ways of seeing. And yeah. I think it was a brilliant project, yeah. you know. And yeah. and again, though, with the, each of us having to kind of pack something in into this, you know, one minute, mm -hmm. you know, where we got our moment to, mm -hmm. to offer some kind of recontextualization. Yeah. And some of it is really funny and some of it's really body and it's mm -hmm. amazing how well it works together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you've worked with Remake also. I guess I'll... A lot I, of remakes. I have also. And, yeah, yeah. Remakes, yeah. I think, is also a really important yeah. topic, you know, yeah, and, and mashups and, yeah. Because there's so much information available, I bet nobody shoots, well, filmmakers maybe, but shoots all their stuff themselves anymore. Oh, mm -hmm. I've been appropriating from the web for yeah. <laughs> yeah, two, two decades around. now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember in grad school, like, it was, it was really difficult for us to think about new ideas and, yeah. like, to actually, like, like, you got this real sense of anxiety that, like, I can't create anything new. There's so much that's already out here and, like, everything's kind of been said in a way, but, like, <laughs> You have to sort of just accept that nobody's going to say it exactly like you. And then, the remix. Right. And, know, then, and, then, yeah. and then you get this, like, there's something really beautiful that happens in a remix because you're sharing context that people have already established. Yeah. So it's mm -hmm. like, it's sort of easier to communicate in a way when you're, like, working with feelings that people have experienced when they've seen, like, a portion of a video before. You can access that really quickly by just sort of, like, even the little mention in yeah. your remix, mm -hmm. you know? Just the way yeah. uh, people around the globe build up sense of similarity because, you know, I'm reading like Gil Deleuze differences and similar uh, repetitions. And by the repetition, they're not exactly the same as previous one, but you're actually making broader and broader, you know, and that's how, even though we don't see our body, uh, through this virtual network, we're building sense of solidarity in a sense. Um, so I want to mention the way we perceive reality is that really matter nowadays when uh, we can make 60, 90 uh, frame per second video when human eyes can only sense 16 frame per second. And is that really matter to uh, define what is actual reality is when our the thing that we see is immediately mediated by the lenses of the camera and we only see through this flat monitor. And who our audience is. Clement Bala is an interesting artist because he thinks about his audience being post-human, mm -hmm. you know, and thinking about making work for machines. You know, and a lot of work that is based on these huge data sets, Lev Manovich, for example, no one could really parse, no human could parse, you know, all of the data and the works that he produces. And so who is our future or even our present audience on some yes. level, too? Yeah. yeah. And I think there's also a bit of a reaction to it, at least like something I've been interested in recently is like, like kind of uh, an embrace of sensuality, an embrace of like yeah. the, mm -hmm. the physical and the body and emotion and like, as sort of a reaction against that hyper-reality that, that does exist. Um, yeah. I mean, you might want to talk about hyper-reality. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> La, como sabemos, no es ninguna novedad lo que voy a decir. 
la realidad es una construcción y la, el modo de construcción actual de la realidad pasa por la tecnología. ¿no? Y, y, en, y en este sentido, vuelvo sobre esto, creo que el, uno de los trabajos centrales del arte es pensar esos modos de deshabituar el cuerpo de los usos tecnológicos. Liberar el cuerpo de, de esos usos y de esas construcciones de realidad. Teodoro Adorno decía que si el arte es un hecho social, no es por reflejarlo, sino más bien por contraponerse a la realidad. Actually, there was a really interesting video presentation by Muntadas, Antonio Muntadas and um, Marshall Rees. Um, for many years have been collecting videos of all the political advertisements since 1962. And they presented all of these, they made a selection, but from 1962 to today, how the candidates presented themselves. So in 1962, it was black and white, 4-3 ratio, one person on the screen talking about one issue. Today, it's the world of entertainment. You know, there's music in the background, and the images are flashing on the screen, and it has nothing to do with elections. It, um, you know, it has more to do with entertainment, like you're hiring an actor to be president, which, hey. <risa> Vuelvo sobre esto. El arte tiene mucho para dar, aún el arte tecnológico, y es esa capacidad de producir una nueva experiencia en los sujetos. Colocarnos en un lugar impensado, inaudito. Well, we can discuss and compare and contrast VR and AR because you're working in virtual reality, I'm working with augmented reality, and, and they're two different paradigms in a way. Virtual reality is kind of full immersion. Yes. And augmented reality is layering physical reality or physical space uh, that's layered over with some kind of virtual, you know, uh, I think experience. A, a, uh, uh, AR has uh -huh. a lot more uh, functional uh, applications application yeah. to real world than the VR, actually. VR yeah. is just a full kind of immersion. Yeah.